Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. It's a beautiful day here in Minnesota. Welcome. We have a great show today. We're going to be talking about a very important issue, an issue that's getting a lot of attention these days. It's the issue of national popular vote. And we are fortunate enough to have two gentlemen on set here who are going to be debating national popular vote live. And hopefully by the end of the show, you're going to have the information and the education and knowledge that you, ne you need so that you can decide. And this is an important issue because uh, you may not know this, but four times in United States history, a president has been elected who did not win the national popular vote. They won uh, the majority of the electoral college, but they didn't win the national vote. So Dallas, if you can pop this on, we're just going to show this real quick. In 1824, John Quincy Adams was elected president despite not winning either the popular vote or the electoral vote. Andrew Jackson was the winner in both categories. Jackson received 38,000 more popular votes than Adams and beat him in the electoral vote 99 to 84. Despite the victories, Jackson did not reach the majority, 131 votes needed in the Electoral College to be declared president. In fact, neither candidate did. The decision went to the House of Representatives, which voted Adams into the White House. In 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes won the election by a margin of one electoral vote, but he lost the popular vote by more than 250,000 ballots to Samuel J. Tilden. In 1888, Benjamin Harrison received 233 electoral votes to Grover Cleveland's 168, winning the presidency. But Harrison lost the popular vote by more than 90,000 votes. And you'll probably remember this one. In 2000, George W. Bush was declared the winner of the general election and became the 43rd president of the United States. But he didn't win the popular vote either. Al Gore holds that distinction, garnering about 540,000 more votes than Bush. However, Bush won the electoral vote 271 to 266. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce our guest for today. Uh, to my left here, I have Mr. Pat Rosenstiel, who is a supporter of National Popular Vote. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. And we have Jake Duesenberg, leader of Tea Party, and he is going to be making the arguments against the national popular vote. And gentlemen, I, I thank you both for uh, coming on the show and yeah, looking forward to this Tony. debate. Happy to be Love here. Love being back. Yeah, it's good to have you. And uh, we're just going to go over some brief ground rules. We're going to keep the debate uh, informal in nature, you know, really with the idea of giving people uh, the information that they need. I have a series of questions that I'm going to ask. And, and really, the only rules we have are don't interrupt each other. Uh, allow your opponent to finish making their points, and then we'll go back and forth. If you need a chance for rebuttal, uh, you'll get your chance to speak your mind on that. Uh, each person is going to get a 90-second introduction. You can just talk about who you are, uh, generally about your position, and uh, anything else you want to in that 90 seconds. And uh, besides for that, those are our rules. So, gentlemen, are you ready to start? It's a lot of rules, Tony. Sure, <laughs> if I like that. <laughs> so, uh, any of you guys want to start? Uh, sure, I'll start. People that have watched the show know me. I'm uh, the right-hand man, I guess, of Tony going back a year ago. Um, I focus a lot on economics when it comes to politics, but uh, what I've done in recent uh, last year is join the Tea Party Alliance effort to get a resurgence of this movement in the state. I have a particular focus on this issue recently because I heard it was pushing through the legislative uh, season, and I said, well, this is bad news for America. This is bad news for Minnesota. Let's fight against this thing. I believe in limited government. I believe in representation of the states. And so that's why I'm opposed to national popular vote. Well, I, I would say I believe in all those things, too, limited government and states' rights and states' power and states' control. I'm a senior consultant for national popular vote. Uh, I think it's important to understand what we're working on, not what people think we're working on. So we're grateful to be here to talk about the issue today. Um, I think when you think about national popular vote, you need to understand that it does three things, right? It guarantees the presidency to the candidate who wins the most votes in all 50 states, and we think that's a good idea. Um, it makes a voter in Minnesota, it treats a voter in Minnesota just like every other voter in the country, um, and we've got the system right now where there are battleground state voters with all the influence 
while the rest of us are mere spectators in presidential elections. And the third thing it does is it preserves the state power to award electors, which I think is uh, important to many um, strict constructionists like myself. Um, Article 2, Section 1 gives the legislature the power to award electors in any manner they deem is in the best interest of their states. Uh, the current system we have today is not the system that the founders envisioned. Um, and frankly, with four out of five voters sitting in flyover states in every presidential election, it is um, sort of um, supersizing the influence of battleground state voters at the expense of the rest of us. And like 75% of Minnesotans, we believe that's a bad idea. Uh, we're grateful that the legislature has taken up our bill and uh, happy to discuss any parts of it. Great. Well, excellent, gentlemen. Uh, thank you again for taking the time on a, a Saturday to uh, come on here. And the fishing and opener of all days. It's fishing opener, yes. Fish <laughs> on. And a beautiful day. We've had a lot of rainy, cold days. That's and true. it's uh, one of the first warm days. So uh, one of the purposes of this show, we, we broadcast on SCC television studios and SPNN, so we have a, a metro audience. And as I listed those four elections where... Uh, the winner of the presidency uh, did not win the, the national popular vote. It, it, it's somewhat rare, 10% occurrence or so. And, you know, so one of the points is to just get the information out there, to get mm -hmm. the education to the viewers of our show so that at the end of the day, they'll get the information and they can decide. I, I don't think a lot of people know about the Electoral College. Right. I don't think they understand it. And uh, so my first question is, and, and Pat, I'll give this one to you, in your own words, Describe the Electoral College in its historical context, and was it a good idea then when the founders made it that way, and is it a good idea now? Yeah, I mean, I think the Electoral College was a good idea then and is a good idea now. The, differ the, the question here isn't national popular vote versus the Electoral College. Um, the Electoral College is the power of the state to award electors. Um, 48 out of 50 states right now use what's called a state-based winner-take-all rule, um, that when the founding fathers um, had, um, you know, 30 votes over 22 separate days, um, you know, um, the, the system we use now or 48 states use now was never even considered. Um, so the Electoral College is the power of the states to award electors. In national popular vote, uh, ask the states whether they want to join a compact with other states and award their electors on the basis of who wins the most popular votes in all 50 states. When states totaling 270 or more electoral votes pass our bill, it triggers and in effect guarantees the electoral college to the candidate who wins the most popular votes in all 50 states, which is the only way to make my vote in Minnesota matter as much as a vote in Mason, Iowa or Madison, Wisconsin, which happen to be battleground states. And when Iowa and Wisconsin are getting 45 post-convention visits, okay, from the presidential campaigns, and Minnesota is getting just one, you've got to ask yourself if that's the best use of our 10 electoral votes. Because what the founders in Article 2, Section 1 said is that each state shall appoint, in a manner the legislature thereof shall direct, a number of electors. That is the Electoral College. It's the power to award those electors. It's not as long as it's on the winner of the popular vote within the state, or if the legislature appoints, or if they're awarded to the winner of the national popular vote. It's whatever the state legislature determines. That is the power under the Electoral College. And we believe it's in the best interest of Minnesota to award their electors to the candidate who wins the most popular votes in all 50 states, because it's the only way to make my vote in Minnesota matter as much as a vote in battleground Ohio. Okay, so the way I would take that on is um, I can't refute a lot of uh, the statement, at least I can't refute the statement that every vote counts because it does. That's what happens in the national popular vote. And the electoral system as it is right now isn't the best system under the planet, but there is no perfect system. We don't live in any utopian society. What happens in a national popular vote it changes a strategy of campaigns. So, yes, they will go to other states, but what states are they going to and where are they going in those states? They're going to metro areas, and that's the big thing that the national popular vote movement doesn't want to talk about is the, the cities, the big cities, the big metropolitan areas are the ones that are going to get the focus of the presidential campaigns. And those issues in those cities are far different than what it is like in rural, uh, the rural part of the country. The other issue with what I had... To, with what he said is uh, if Minnesota voted for candidate X but all other 49 states in the aggregate voted for candidate Y then we give all of our elector electors to candidate Y but Minnesota's voice is candidate X I prefer a system even though as a guy that generally votes for Republican have not liked the result of our electors 
I would rather we take Minnesota's votes and uh, give that our electors to that person. And a uh, question, I'll let you read about him, uh, but why didn't the founders devise national popular vote from the beginning? Was that an idea that they had? Well, the founders, like I said, took 30 votes over 22 separate days at the Constitutional Convention, and they could not agree, right, on what method they would dictate. Uh, to the states to award electors. Uh, Madison wanted what looked more like popular vote of like landed, you know, property owners who had the right to vote at that time, usually males. Hamilton wanted what looked more like a king. When they could not agree over 30 days, they determined that they were going to pattern uh, the system we elect a president from under the ecclesiastical method of electing a pope, a college of cardinals, and that the states would use that power and determine how they want to award their electors. So, it's so they rejected all kinds of different methods that they used, right? For example, they rejected governors appointing electors, uh, though various states have used that method, you know, since they've become states. So um, the Electoral College basically says that we're going to leave the check in the hands of the state government in order to provide an effective check on the federal magistrate. The other thing I want to rebut, um, uh, first of all, y yeah, the trade-off is, is that every voter in Minnesota matters in order to do that. We award our electors on the basis of who wins the national popular vote. That's a trade-off I and 75% of Minnesotans are willing to make. The one thing I'd like to rebut is the idea that people would just campaign in cities. I kind of had the same thought frankly, and I did the work and went out and did the political demography. And I know that if you add up the population in the top 50 cities in America, right, it's 15% of the vote and shrinking. Um, so I've never given a candidate any advice that would encourage them to ignore 85% of the voters that live outside of the big cities. The big cities just aren't that big. And the idea that anybody would ignore rural America is sort of not true either. Because if you go to 2010 census data, 20% of America lives in communities of less than 2,500 people. And I've never talked to a single candidate in my extensive political experience that chose to holistically ignore 20% of the voters. That's how you lose campaigns. That's just a false statement. Uh, so what you refer to when you say that the, the big cities and the rest live in 85% li live outside of those cities is you're just taking like the proper of like Minneapolis. So I've seen the statistic off the National Popular Votes website. They say that the top 50 cities only have 15% of the population. What they're measuring is this metro area, only Minneapolis proper, 380,000 people. Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the greater metro area represent 3 million people. So that's a, that's a terrible statistic. It's very deceiving. When you put the top metro areas, the top 50 metro areas in the country, that's 54% of the population. And the other thing about that is of the top of the cities that have 500,000 or more people, they go, they, they, in 2012, they went 70% for Barack Obama. I mean, it was a landslide victory. Those are the metro hubs, so guess where the get out the vote campaigns are going to be? They're going to be right there in those metro hubs where they can turn on another million people to get that victory for the Democratic candidate. Uh, he didn't challenge sort of my statistic. I said in the top 50 cities, I'll even grant you that in the top 50 metropolitan areas, it's 54% of the voters. You tell, a me a single, you tell me a single campaign that has focused or ignored 46% of the voters, and I'll show you a losing campaign. Tim Pawlenty, when he ran for governor of the state of Minnesota, he was elected and re-elected, and he lost all of the big cities in the state of Minnesota. I mean, George Pataki lost every big city in the state of New York, and he was elected and re-elected governor. So the idea, and I've got a little of experience running political campaigns in my lifetime, the idea that campaigns are going to ignore voters anywhere um, you ask anybody who's run for office what voters in their district they ignore, and they will tell you no one. And right now we've got a system where voters in four out of five states are holistically ignored by the presidential campaigns in the general election campaign because systemically it's set up to do that. So, you know, you and I can argue all day about whether or not politicians are going to ignore voters when those voters matter to the outcome of their election. There's a whole body of experience that would argue they won't. Yeah, I don't know what you mean by ignore. What I'm saying is the mass movement, the mass strategy is going to be in those metro areas. If you bring in all cities over 50,000 people, um, that represents 85% of the population. So people under 50,000, cities of 50,000 people, that's like 15% of the population. The masses live in big cities. And so there is going to be a huge get out the vote campaign in those big metro areas. Now, the other thing about that is LA, New York City, San Francisco, places like that, 
Those states, the Democrats don't need to worry about. The liberal candidates don't need to worry about. They go over there, they visit them, they do a fundraising event, and then they take those resources to a swing state. What they're going to do now is they're going to go to New York City and L.A., people that don't represent the viewpoints of Minnesota, and they're going to launch a big out the vote campaign, and they have a chance of getting out millions of more people. And by the way, the liberal candidates generally overwhelmingly have support in those areas. In fact, Barack Obama in 2012 had 70% in metro areas over 500,000 people. So we're going to move on to the next question. You guys are making some great points here. And uh, second question starts with you, Jake. In your own words, what is the national popular vote? And if enough states join the compact, what are the ramifications of national popular vote? It, How is it going to affect everyday American it's life? It's a backdoor to amending the Constitution. I mean, he's right. Article 2, Section 1 says that the states have a right to determine their electors. No doubt about that. Article 1, Section 10 says that states can't join into compacts with one another. What we're doing is we're back, it's a backdoor to amending the Constitution because that'd be a difficult process. So if we go by each state legislature and get them to vote how to change their electors by uh, responding to the will of all, uh, all of America, all the other states, then all they need is 271 electoral votes and they're 60% of the way there and they have basically changed the outcome of the, the, uh, the presidential election. And the other thing is they've really changed the strategy. I just don't buy into this idea that rural Minnesota is now going to see more of the candidates. Minneapolis probably will, but not rural Minnesota, not uh, rural uh, states. They, it's going to be, there's still going to be the flyover states because the metro areas, there's no population out there that's worthy of all that effort. Pat? Um, didn't really explain national popular vote in his own words. I guess I'll take on this back door of the Constitution or end run of the Constitution If you could, if you could first. explain national popular vote. Well, I've already explained it, which mm -hmm. is it's an interstate compact. It's an agreement amongst the states where when 270 or more electoral votes are in the compact because states have exercised their sovereign po power as a legislature, as granted under Article 2, Section 1, they've determined this is in their best interest. It then goes into effect. That's what national popular vote is. The idea that we would amend the Constitution to make this change is like saying we would change the White Bear City Charter to fill a pothole. Um, the power is granted. It's the most exclusive power reserved to the states in the United States Constitution. It's pre-Tenth Amendment stuff. As a Tea Party guy, I'm sure you've read the Tenth Amendment. But Article 2, it. Section 1, right? Article 2, Section 1 clearly leaves this decision within the hands of the legislature. It does so in a reason. When Maine and Nebraska moved to a congressional district system, there was not this outcry by the Tea Party for them to have a constitutional convention in order for them to move to a congressional district system. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts has had 12 different methods with which they have awarded electors since statehood. Now, he's clearly said that Article 2, Section 1 leaves this power in the hands of the legislature, and Article 1, Section 10 clearly gives the state the power to form agreements. So the idea that we would amend the Constitution and permanently strip the state of Minnesota of its power to award electors is, I think, a dangerous thought and a dangerous idea, particularly if enough states adopt I want to preserve the sovereign power of the state to pull out if any of these unintended consequences occur. I don't think they will, but if they do, I'd like to preserve it. Now, the idea that rural voters matter under the current system is, ignores political reality. Um, when you take the 13 smallest population states, those with four or less electoral votes, 12 of the 13 are flyover. Six are reliably red and six are reliably blue. And the idea that they participate in presidential campaigns ignores the facts. Okay, it, it ignores the facts of the current system. Four out of five voters are left on the political sidelines. When you add up the one billion dollars that was spent running for president in 2012, two-thirds of it was spent in four states. Virginia, Ohio, uh, Virginia, Ohio, Florida, and Iowa. Those four states got two-thirds of the money, right? 49, uh, 39 states got zero. They were political ATMs that exported their political economy and their political influence. This current system is not working for rural voters. It's not working for small states. And they are, their interests are being sold out to the interest of battleground state voters. So the idea that this current system needs to be changed through a constitutional amendment as a strict constructionist, I reject. And the idea that this current system is actually working for rural America ignores the facts. Here's, here's what you're misunderstanding. Okay, you're right about the constitutional argument. What I'm saying is 
if we were just to amend the Electoral College under Article 2, Section 1, we would have to amend the Constitution. It does grant the states the right to decide their electors. There's a national movement which is funded heavily by liberals. The board of directors all, are all liberals, so you got to wonder why is, is there all that money behind this effort? And what they're doing is they're creating a strategy that does the same thing as if we were amended. But why are they doing that? Because that has a higher chance of success in actually having Congress pass this bill and three quarters of the states ratifying. They know that. They can't get that uh, kind of amendment uh, added to the Constitution. The reason we're pursuing this route is because we're a constitutionally conservative organization and we believe that the founders got it right and the power exists to make this change within the confines of the Constitution. The idea that our board of directors is a liberal organization um, is frankly not true. It is. I mean, we launched with true. guys like Jake Garn, who was probably the most conservative member of the United States Senate from the state of Utah. The idea that this is a liberal movement is not true. We just passed the Oklahoma Senate 28 to 16, not the most liberal body on the planet, and we passed the New York Senate 57 to 4. This is a nonpartisan, this is a bipartisan supported so nonpartisan solution to a pretty real problem that 70% of the American people agree with. And I don't know why a Tea Party would find it objectionable that we would want to make every Tea Party voter in every state <laughs> relevant in every presidential election. I mean, I don't know what we're hiding from if we believe that limited government is a good idea and that a majority of the American people agree with that. As a Tea Party guy, I don't understand what we're hiding from. I, I believe that every Tea Party voter in every state should matter in every presidential election because then we won't be spending $978 billion on prescription drugs to win the voters of Florida. So do you believe in a democracy, a direct democracy? No, direct democracy would be an initiative and referendum, and we would not elect a president. So let's get some definitions. But you do believe straight. in it for electing uh, a president. I believe, that in a republic, I believe that in a republic, the candidate who gets the most votes ought to win an election. The, sta yes. the statement that it's not a uh, board of directors is not liberal is just false. I mean, I've looked up their FEC reports. John Cozy, your chairman, is a multi-million dollar, yeah, he's a multi-million sure. dollar donor to liberal causes, liberal candidates. Stephen Silverstein, a member of the board of directors, a multi-million dollar liberal donor. Uh, Barry Fadham is another donor to liberal groups and politicians. It's made up heavily of liberals. So my big question is, why would these progressives, why would these liberals be behind such a, uh, a strategy? And I think it's very evident. When you look at the population of the United States, the largest amount of people live in the metro areas around the country, and they know they have a tactical advantage there. And here's a good case in point. Minnesota, we appreciate our gun rights, but metro areas across the United States generally do not appreciate gun rights the way that people in rural areas do. So guess what the presidential candidates are going to talk about? you know, some kind of gun restrictions because that is the mood of the country in the metro areas, the, the audience that they're going to cater to. It's the population centers. Do you have another question? <laughs> so we'll move, on, we'll move on to the next one. When, when I did the introduction, you know, I noted that four United States presidents have been elected without winning the national popular vote. Dallas, if we can uh, just flip through these pictures again. Uh, these are, the, these are the, the four elections that ended uh, here's the next one. You see the, the poster here. This is Rutherford B. Hayes versus Samuel Tilden. Awesome graphics. And, uh, yeah, fraud, <laughs> of the, uh, fraud of the century is, uh, is what they called it back then. Uh, this one right here, Benjamin Harrison versus Grover Cleveland. This was another one where the winner did not win the national popular vote. And then the last one was Bush uh, versus Gore in 2000. And we certainly all remember that one because we didn't have a... That was the first time in my, my memory where there was... No winner declared that night, and it took a while for them to determine the winner. And, you know, some people argue that this is a threat to the Democratic Republic. It's a threat to the Constitution when you can't decisively come up with a winner. Uh, but my question is, in these examples, uh, is it fair that the president should uh, be elected and not win the national popular vote? Why or why not? Well, look, it was fair under those elections. I mean, the rule of the game was the candidate who won the most electoral votes under a system of winner-take-all rules would be elected president of the United States. And so that's why so much focus was sort of put on Florida. Uh, I think we spent more money in Florida in the last six weeks of the campaign than 42 other states combined. That's one of the problems we're trying to fix. I think there were fair outcomes. Uh, I think the idea that four out of 57 presidential elections is not often um, I, I would reject that claim. I mean, I think that's very often. That's four out of 44 presidents, 
right? And if I, if, if, if four out of 44 times when I left Minneapolis to fly to Washington, D.C. and accidentally landed in Atlanta, you know, that would be a problem. That would be inconvenient for me. Um, big things happen when, quote unquote, the wrong winner wins, right? The guy with the least popular votes wins the election. Um, that, that, uh, that Hayes and, and Tilden election, the end result was a deal that was cut between political hacks and electoral college commissions. And the deal was we'll pull federal troops out of the South, leading to 100 years or 80 years of Jim Crow. I mean, that was the deal that was cut to solve that crisis. And so when it does happen, there are very real crises that occur. When you, saw, when you showed um, John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, the end result of that story was that Andrew Jackson formed the modern Democratic Party in America and said, I'm going to get so many votes they can't keep me out of the White House. Now, I think there should be a Democratic Party in America. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it just shows that big things happen. And I will say that 2000 has led to the most divisive political environment I've ever seen in my lifetime, the outcome in 2000. I'm not sure if that would have been the outcome under national popular vote. As a Bush guy, we were prepared to do recounts, and we were prepared to make a case that the current system is not fair because we believed we were going to lose Florida and win the national popular vote. And there were memos floating all over the place about getting clergy involved, challenging the integrity of the current system because we thought the opposite was going to be the result. Right? And so this shouldn't come down to one election or politics or one party versus the other. This is should every voter in every state matter equally or be treated the same by the person who would want to be the commander in chief. And I don't think that's such a I don't think that's such a revolutionary concept. Jake, do you think that that's true? I mean, you know, you made a good point that after the 2000 election and, and maybe it wasn't exactly that election because shortly thereafter we were at the, the dot com bust and also we had September 11th. So there was a lot of polarizing events. But, uh, you know, in my memory, of course, I was younger in the 90s, but I, I remember a, a more friendly rhetoric between Democrats and Republicans. And post this election, there did seem to be more uh, divisiveness. And, and so my question back is, is the original question, Jake, is the, the national popular vote, is it fair that a president doesn't have to win uh, the majority in, in order to become the next president? Um, yes, I, I think it's fair. I mean, there's just no great system out there. But what he is offering is a direct democracy for a president. And it would be equivalent to us saying, well, all right, after the tragedy of Sandy Hook, we should all take a vote on guns, on gun restrictions. And at that point, I would say the polls showed that the majority of Americans wanted to infringe on the Second Amendment. So, no, I don't always believe in a direct vote for uh, issues or offices. I think it's good. We have a, a country that's got a, a various systems of how we repre represent ourselves with our republic. And um, the other question you asked me right before that, because you had something, um, I can't remember what it was. You were going somewhere with that uh, the divisiveness? Yeah, the divisiveness, yep. Yeah. Um, the, this idea that like 2000 and today's politics is more divisive than anything else, it's like they used to have duels back in the day. They used to make life threats. I mean, it's, never, right. been, it's never been this one warm, fuzzy area in politics. I mean, that's just politics at its best. Um, so, no, I don't really buy into that idea that, you know, 2000 or anything like that was the most divisive time in American history. Uh, the only thing I'd say about direct democracy, again, is I think your Sandy Hook example is a perfect explanation of direct democracy, which is where voters vote specifically on an issue. Direct democracy is not electing a candidate. When I, when I go and cast my vote in a majority or plurality vote election for the state legislature, I'm not participating in direct democracy. I'm hiring an elected representative to represent my mm -hmm. views. And so the idea that national popular vote is direct democracy sort of um, ignores the definition of what direct democracy is. So, Well, in terms of just every... It's a popular vote election. Yeah, right. It's a first-past-the-post election, just like we elect a governor, just like we elect a U.S. senator, just like we elect representatives in the legislature and Congress. I, I mean, that's not direct democracy. Direct democracy is well, we Sandy didn't. Hook, let's put... Uh, direct democracy is a ballot initiative around school choice. Right. That's direct democracy. That says, should we have school choice or should we not have school choice? Let's let the people decide. That's direct democracy. National popular vote is not direct democracy. National popular vote says, let's award the presidency on the basis of which candidate gets the most popular votes in all 50 states, and it preserves the state power to award electors. Yeah, but I'm not... And that's just a fact. I'm not 
undermining the whole republic. What I'm saying is when, when you shift to how you vote for the president, it's the same way as a direct democracy works. You directly, every vote counts as one, and that is the way that you elect the president. I'm not saying that a whole system now goes to a direct democracy. I'm just saying that's the way that you're proposing we select the president. And by the way, the senators weren't originally that way until the passage of the 17th Amendment by well, state. And you, uh, exactly. And there was a repeal of the 17th Amendment because... There wasn't a they, repeal. I mean, no, there was the 17th Amendment that gave right. people the vote to write the right to vote for right. the U.S. Senate. Right. Yeah. And I'd be opposed to that. I think that it was a better system where the state legislatures picked senators as representatives. Why? I just think that uh, when you get to direct popular votes, what you're doing is you're, you're basically launching a different strategy. You're, you're buying off votes, and there's a large part of the population that listens to certain kind of marketing techniques. We see it all the time in politics. Certain things work. Uh, they, uh, they're not, they're, the, average, the average voter isn't making the decision that some of our representatives could make. Now, there's no perfect system, once again, because obviously there have been chances for representatives of our republic to screw up on those votes. But uh, what I would re much rather prefer is have different types of ways of electing our, our uh, representatives. First of all, the House of Representatives is a direct, or direct vote. A Senate was originally uh, a layer between that, and then the President was one other kind of layer. So we had three different ways that our national offices were filled. Now what we would have is basically all three of them being filled the same way, a direct vote. Well, and I don't think that's the, the, the president, preferred method. The President currently is being elected by a direct vote of the states. Right. I mean, look, if, if anybody's concerned about mob rule, um, quote unquote, the mob is already ruling. It's ruling within the states. And what that's doing is setting up a system where there's an imbalance between voters of each state. There are states that matter very, very, very much and really persuadable battleground micro-targeted voters within those battleground states, like No Child Left Behind and Minivan Driving Moms in Ohio, mm -hmm. right? That's the current system. Right? That's what happens under the current system. And four out of five voters in four out of five states, like Alaska, taken for granted, nobody's trying to figure out what issues matter to them. And so that has a very real impact on how we elect the president of the United States. And while I agree with you, there is no perfect system. The beauty of national popular vote, and going back to your question about why don't we just do a constitutional amendment, is because that doesn't allow us to have the conversation about what's in the better interest of the state of Minnesota. Right? You permanently pull that power away from the legislature, you're permanently stuck with a national popular vote system. And I couldn't support that. Mm -hmm. But I can support national popular vote because I believe that national popular vote is in the better interest of my home state of Minnesota than the current winner-take-all rule. And it's hard to make a case against that. It well, really is, I given what the current easy. system looks well, like. Well, I think it's very easy, because as I've said many times, the, the majority of the population lives in bigger metro areas. And so you have to see how these, these presidential campaigns will change their strategy. They're going to actually go where the, the population centers are, where they can get those millions of other votes. And when you look at the population and uh, the people that are eligible for voting, there's, uh, what, 50 to 60 percent of the population that's eligible that actually votes. So the big thing for a presidential campaign is how do you get those other uh, 50, 40 percent people to turn out and vote? And we already know in those metro areas that limited government candidates, Tea Party style candidates or conservative candidates are at a huge disadvantage. And the reasons being is people in metro areas have different beliefs and different cultures than people in other parts of the country. I'm not saying that it's great that we focus on a couple states, you know. Uh, not that I'm a was a big fan of Mitt Romney, but watching Pennsylvania go early, that was tough to see. But needless to say, I know under the system, I'm going to watch what happens in L.A. and New York City and see how many people turn out for voting, and it's not going to be the kind of candidate that I want. But, but uh, okay, so let's just grant a majority of people live in the metropolitan areas of Minneapolis, St. Paul, right? Right in the state of Minnesota. Yes. A majority, majority of the people of in the state of Minnesota live in Minnesota. To accept your premise, I would have to say that the Polanyi campaign or the conservative campaign or the Republican campaign for governor would hunker just down in the Twin Cities metropolitan area, and that's how they'd run their election to win the governorship. Right. And I know for sure that that's not what we did because every voter in the state of Minnesota went to that statewide total and we were running our margins in what we call the Republican L traditionally 
mm -hmm. right, in the state of Minnesota. You know, if you know politics, you sort of know this. This is like from the Canadian border in the western part of the state down and all the way over through Rochester and Winona. And the reason that we focus on those voters is because that's where we can turn out our voters. And it's cheaper to reach those voters, frankly, mm -hmm. right? Because you reach voters through television a lot, and the cost per point in those television markets is lower. So the truth is, is that voters are voters everywhere. And the idea, I mean, if your entire premise is that presidential candidates are going to ignore 46% of the voters when they run for president under national popular that. vote, then I think you, you need to think a little deeper about your position and, 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 and figure out whether or not you think you're right or I'm right. Because if you are concerned about rural voters, there's a real reason to get on board national popular vote. Yeah, I mean, I, when you say ignore, presidential campaigns don't ignore people per se. It's just where they put or flex their muscle, put most of their power. And I don't even think Minneapolis, St. Paul's the greatest case because that metro area is far smaller than areas like New York City and L.A. and Chicago. So that's really where their focus is going to be. And they're going to come in. Now, I mean, we're, when you're comparing a statewide election to an election that's nationwide, it's different. In Minnesota, yes, you're right about that. But then again, I would argue that I'm not certain Tim Pliny was the most limited government kind of candidate. And I'm not saying that the national popular vote's the death of the Republican Party. What I'm saying is it's the death of the people that I usually represent, the people that believe in a limited government, wow. free markets, fiscal responsibility, the issues that don't, don't generally get a lot of uh, credence in the big cities. I think it's the only way to make every one of your limited government Tea Party voters matter in every state they live in, which I think gives them more influence, not less. And I think it's a way to make them relevant beyond the primaries. Right. And I think that's true on both sides of the aisle for sort of ideologues, whether right. it's Democrats or Republicans. And I think, you know, based on what you're saying today, I'm, I'm going to give you my copy of the book. I hope you'll read it. So we're going to move to the next question now. Uh, Ten states have passed or, uh, this into law or joining the, the National Popular Vote Compact, along with uh, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., making it the 11th. And it's passing with pretty broad bipartisan support. And I know that the debate is starting to get heated up here in Minnesota. And if you look, uh, there are Republicans like uh, congressional candidate Tom Emmer, who supports national popular vote. Uh, Senator Brandon Peterson, who is a Republican a state senator here, he supports national popular vote. Uh, senator Karen Housley, she supports national popular vote. A number of uh, Democrat legislators, uh, they also uh, support it. So it seems to be a growing uh, coalition here. Jim Abler did support it uh, last changed. year, but now he's running for U.S. Senate, and he has changed his position. Um, he said he didn't uh, study it enough up front or, or, or something. But, um, Jake, my question for you, you, you you're claiming that this is a, a strictly a liberal uh, issue, but with Tom Emmer supporting nas national popular vote, I don't think anyone's ever accused Tom Emmer of being a liberal. Um, but why why is he supporting it, and why are Who's other paid? big name Republicans? Tom, Tom, Tom Emmer was a paid lobbyist, and I mean I can't pretend like I understand what's in here in Tom Emmer, but he was a paid lobbyist, and people can be bought off. That's as old as politics is. Brandon Peterson's paid by Ainsley Shea, uh, so is Tim Sanders, the two guys that was originally sponsored the bill. They've now taken their names off the sponsorship of HF 799 in the one in the Senate. Um, so some of it is just about being paid, but I think a lot of Republicans, and I've met with a lot of them that voted back in May 2013 for HF 799, didn't actually understand the arguments of it once we brought that argument up. And there's not a lot of people on my side nationwide. The National Popular Vote is a very well-funded and very well-strategized uh, organization. Uh, they heard those that side of the argument. Once they heard the contrary side of the argument, I think they rethought that position. That's why guys like Jim Abler have rethought his vote. Can you just uh, clarify by, by being paid? Are you saying that their campaigns are being paid? Yeah, or? I mean, Ainsley Shea, your organization. Brandon Peterson's a senior counselor on your website, and so is Tim Sanders. They're yeah. both... Uh, I can address all, all of those issues. The idea that they any of them support a national popular vote because they were paid is sort of insulting to them and a little insulting to that's me. That's how I meant it. Tom, uh, <laughs> no, that's great. But, but, but Tom Emmer was a supporter of national popular vote back when he was in the legislature. Um, he was a green vote to move it out of committee. Um, he supported national popular vote as a legislator when nobody was, because he thought it was good public policy, because he actually knew what he was talking about. He actually read the book. He actually studied the bill. Um, opponents raised sort of uh, issue about Brandon Peterson and Tim Sanders. Um, frankly, Tim Sanders' uh, sponsorship of our bill predates 
Ainsley Shea as a company, just, you know, for the record. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he has been a sponsor and an ongoing champion of the issue and continues to be a champion of the issue. Uh, Brandon Peterson um, was a supporter of the bill and a sponsor of the bill before I even knew who he was. You know, based on the fact that he did his research and he's a strict constructionist and he believes that we've got a movement that needs to be empowered in all 50 states. And I think if you were sitting here today, he would voice very clear support for this bill and this position. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the idea that the reason Republicans are supporting this bill is because they're getting paid um, sort of ignores the fact that over 2,100 legislators have voted for our bill or sponsored our bill across the country. And it's sort of a cheap political shot. And, and frankly, I believe that serious, serious, serious issues require serious debate. Serious issues require serious conversation and not sort of cheap gimmicks around who supports what for what reason. The idea that Tom Emmer supports national popular vote because he was paid to do so is sort of, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a, and not because I'm Tom Emmer, I'm just offended by the comment. Well, that's fine if you're offended, but I mean, a lot of voters they care about that issue. In fact, that's why both Tim Sanders and Brandon Peterson have recused themselves for voting on those uh, bills in the Senate and the House. Uh, the other thing is this idea that Republicans support it and so it could be a good idea or it's bipartisan is hogwash. Mitt Romney the other day came out and supported minimum wage. That doesn't mean minimum wage is a good idea. It's contrary to the marketplace. Mike Huckabee and many other Republican former governors and current governors are in favor of Common Core. That doesn't mean Common Core is good. So, listen, I don't know if there's a direct uh, monetary benefit for these people, if it's indirect, or if they just they believe in their heart. Either way, it doesn't mean it's right just because a couple of Republicans. I disagree with a lot of Republicans on a lot of issues. Hell, I'm in the Tea Party. What do you think that is? You know, just uh, a wing of the Republican Party? No, we, we look outside of the party and look at free markets, fiscal responsibility, constitutional limit government, stay true to those principles. I would say just, you know, for, for the good of the order, I would say that, um, you know, Dean Murray, right, was one of our first Republican supporters in the state of New York. And Dean Murray was the first Tea Party uh, candidate ever elected to public office. And he was elected in the state of New York. And the idea that um, my opponent speaks for the Tea Party, if he does, um, I, I, I'm confused on how he could. Um, at the end of the day, what's really important to me is that every voter in every state matter in every presidential election and that the voters get to be heard no matter where they live when they elect the president of the United States. And there doesn't seem to me to be anything more consistent with the Tea Party philosophy than that. And I've spoken to many members of the Tea Party all across the country. I've presented in front of many of them. And when we start, I ask, how many people think national popular vote's a good idea? And not a single hand goes up. And they talk about all the things that you talk about. And I answer every one of their questions. And when I go out, more than a majority raise their hand. Because at the end of the day, they believe, like 75% of Americans, that persuadable audiences within battleground states should not make the uh, decisions for the rest of us. And they're tired of a system where American presidents get transactional with persuadable battleground state voters. So if you care about any of the issues you say that you care about, national popular vote makes a great deal of sense vis-a-vis -vis the current system, which is why Tom Emmer, why Kurt Zellers, why I would think Jim Abler voted for the bill. And the truth is, is it was the biggest issue in Tom Emmer's uh, endorsement. And he was endorsed on the first ballot with 75% of the vote. So the idea that there's this huge movement out there led by Mr. Dusing opposed to the national popular vote on either side of the aisle, um, you know, I watch Twitter. <laughs> uh, go visit the Tea Party. I've never seen you at one of our Tea Party events. Happy to do okay. your next event. Please and, send me an invite. And uh, we're overwhelmingly opposed to the uh, national popular vote. Even Tea Party groups outside of our uh, Tea Party Alliance, which has seven different groups, mostly around the metro area, those are unified behind this thing. They've had a lot of influence over legislators uh, on this issue, and a lot of the conservative legislators, the, the real champions, warriors up at the House, are adamantly opposed to this thing. So I, I don't know where you're getting it. I mean, of course Republicans are going to favor some kind of a bad plan for conservatives. It happens all the time. Mitt Romney came out for minimum wage. Mike Huckabee for Common Core, I just don't see that being a real important argument here. And as far as the monetary thing goes, I mean, voters care about that kind of stuff, and that's so why they recuse them. Question, and this is more of a, just a curiosity question, mm -hmm. what is the, the 
progress of national popular vote in the Minnesota legislature? Is it uh, going to pass here or? Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I never make any predictions on that. The one thing I don't control is I don't control the legislative calendar. You don't, you know, the Democrats obviously do. Um, you, you know, I think there's a, a, a very deep, very ongoing discussion going on with the people who have been ordained by the founders to make this decision, which is the legislature. Um, we were in the House last year. Uh, we lost on bipartisan opposition by four votes. We've been working diligently to continue to educate on this issue and ask the question, what's in the better interest of the state of Minnesota? I believe that we're making progress. I believe it's an important issue that requires requires serious conversation and serious debate and serious, um, you know, investigation and, and, and the intellectual power of the idea over time um, sort of wins out. That's my experience. So as to what the Minnesota legislature is going to do, I'm going to leave that to the Minnesota legislature because the one thing that the founders were more concerned about than the people were factions. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that had the founders really concerned is factions and groups of people making lots of noise that get in the way, small groups of people making lots of noise that get in the way of progress and good decisions amongst our elected officials. You know, one of, uh, one of the, the other things that uh, at least President George Washington was famous for in his uh, uh, farewell address is he, t he had a disdain for the party system. And he thought that if the parties gained too much control, that it would threaten the Constitution or threaten the Republic. And admittedly, the, the chance nowadays of a third party <laughs> candidate winning uh, the presidential election e with the current system, uh, the electoral system, I, I think is pretty, uh, it's, it's an odd chance. It, it, but there have been some candidates in the recent past, Ross Perot, uh, Dr. Ron Paul did pretty well when he ran as a third party. Uh, they have built up some impressive numbers. and. In '88, he didn't do well. Didn't he run in uh, in uh, as a Constitution? Yeah, uh, Libertarian Party in oh, 1988. Okay. Okay. I was unaware. And uh, so, it's a long shot. But regardless, my question is: in terms of national popular vote, would this make it pave the way, make it easier for a third party candidate to to come in and, and win the presidency, or is it? going to solidify a D versus R for, is that for the rest of our lives? I have no idea. I, I haven't even thought that through. So if you yeah, thought I, I, that I mean, I, you know, I think the reason you see third party movements, I mean, look, the Republican Party was a third party movement. They did not believe that the Whigs, right, were representing their interest. And I, it, you know, I think that the Republican Party came up, formed a party under the current system. And the reason they formed a party is because they could create a strong regional foothold that might you know, throw the presidency into Congress, mm -hmm. right? And that is sort of under the current system. Under national popular vote, you got to be a pretty well organized, pretty right. I think it probably, I'm not going to say it favors or disfavors a third party or two party system or any of that other stuff. But if you're concerned about the emergence of third parties, which I'm not concerned about, I think it's sort of a healthy thing in, in, right. in, 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 in a republic to have the ability for third parties to emerge. But they emerge under the current system because they believe they can have regional footholds that will allow them to negotiate with the other candidates that are running for president. And that's why Strom Thurmond ran as a Dixiecrat. You know, that's why, um, that's why Teddy Roosevelt formed the Bull Moose Party. That's why Abraham Lincoln and his friends formed, you know, the Republican Party out of Ripon. And, you know, either system can be amenable to that. Looked like Ross Perot could have won a national popular vote for a little while. I think, you know, over time that probably wouldn't have happened because right. sort of games on the ground are important. And, you know, we happen to be Republicans. There are other Democrats out there. You and I are going to agree on nine out of ten things. I, I can tell that about us already. You know, but we both participate on the ground. Um, and that that helps the two major parties. What do you think, Jake? Does the national <laughs> party... Does money have money is the most important thing for a third party. And Ross Perot is the only notable guy there that actually had some kind of traction as a third party candidate. And why is that? Because he had a lot of money invested into it. So I don't, I don't know. I, I haven't thought that through. Um, needless to say, really, if the third party candidates want to get some traction, it's either going to be the death of a political party, which I think very well could happen with the Republican Party, eventually here in the next decade or so, or it's because a third party candidate's very well funded and has a message that's, that's, that's resilient with, or resonates with the people. So, so th the way the Electoral College works, and correct me if I'm, I'm speaking in factually here, but each state 
gets one electoral vote per congressional district, uh, right. plus the entire state gets two, which represents right. their two U.S. Senate seats. One of the proposals out there, and, and I think you mentioned that some states have actually adopted this, but that each congressional district would have mm -hmm. their own uh, congressional popular vote yep. for president, and then uh, that electoral vote would go to whoever they voted on and, and yeah. so on and so forth. And then the state, whoever wins the popular vote in the state, would get those two. So Minnesota, hypothetically, could give uh, you know five to one and five to the other candidate. And uh, people say that this is a, a good idea because it localizes the election. It, it makes the influence in the, uh, of the voter in their region ha have a stronger influence in their vote. Would you be opposed to this idea? Oh, yeah. I think a congressional district system takes a bad system and makes it worse. Um, you know, and Kurt Doubt and Marty Seifert, two people who I think last week announced their opposition to national popular vote, introduced a congressional district bill. And my response to them was, at least we all agree there's a problem, right? And that's good. And we, at least we all agree that the legislature has the power to award electors. And that's good. The reason I say a congressional district system takes a bad system and makes it worse Right, is because as opposed to battleground states, you will now have roughly 45 competitive congressional districts in presidential politics. Right, So all the attention will be on 45 congressional districts. And it won't be about what do the voters in the I-4 corridor of Florida want from the American president. It'll be what does the Mayo Clinic want from the American president because it happens to be mm -hmm. in the first congressional district. And so it makes less people relevant, not more people relevant. And if you want to make every Tea Party voter in every state matter in every presidential election, a congressional district makes fewer of them matter in fewer presidential elections. Plus, I know a little bit about redistricting. I don't know if either of you guys have experienced any of the craziness around redistricting. Oh, yeah. Get presidential politics involved in redistricting and then tell me how you like a congressional district system. Well, it already it is. It will be a mess. It, I mean, just to win the House of Representatives, it's huge already. So I agree with that point. You know, uh, I would favor that more than a national popular vote. It's, it's more regional based. It, it represents a wide range of viewpoints. It's not so much focused on metro areas, although I would imagine a lot of those districts would be in the metro suburbs or the uh, suburbs of a lot of those big cities. Um, the, the thing about it is, I guess my consistency is that now tilts it in favor of my candidates, and I just, I'm not going to get behind this. If I would say if someone wanted to push that issue nationwide, it's going to be heavily funded by conservatives because it's probably going more in our favor under that system. Um, I just like the way that our our uh, republic set up, uh, that the House of Representatives voted that way, that the uh, that the Senate was originally voted or found by the state legislatures or voted by the state legislatures and then the president was through Electoral College. I'm just fine keeping the Electoral College system the same. There's pros and cons to every single system but we have to ask the question why would we change the way that we select the most powerful position in the United States of America, and when you look at who's behind it, the large donors behind uh, national popular vote, you have to question, why are they liberal? Why would they like that kind of system? Um, well, as to the donors, and, and one other point that I make on a congressional district system, mm -hmm. as to the donors, there are two donors that have funded about 98% of our activity. One is Dr. John Koza, who is a progressive, right? He right. believes there's yep. a better way to elect the president of the United States. The other, through a different organization called Support Popular Vote, which was the organization that Tom Emmer worked for, mm -hmm. was funded by an anti-Buffett rule, pro-life, uh, political refugee, independent named Tom Golisano mm -hmm. out of New York who started Paychecks. Both of them think there's a better way to elect the president. None of them personally benefit from any of this. They just think that this is a, a better system to use. So just to, to deal with the, you know, the money a little bit, because I think that is, I, I mean, it's I think it's relevant to it. know who sort of funds it, right? Yep. I've contributed to national popular vote. I've personally contributed to the effort. I am anything but a liberal, okay? <laughs> and I like liberals. I think reasonable people can disagree <laughs> on a lot of different issues. I don't think people who care about politics on any side of the spectrum are particularly evil. And I enjoy having good quality conversations with them, confident in knowing where I'm at. But the one thing you need to think about on a congressional district system, mm -hmm. right, is if you're concerned about, I guess Democrats would call it um, um, voter suppression and we would call it voter integrity, right? Um, if you're concerned about voter integrity, think about the fact that the, 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 the small number of votes that need to be manufactured in a congressional, closely divided congressional district in order to win one electoral vote. 
right? Now think about it under the current system, right? There's a reason you're manufacturing 10,000 votes in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. when you believe Wisconsin's going to be the swing state. It's so that you can steal the battleground state of Wisconsin, at which, you know, at, at which point you can impact the entire American presidency. Now, if you go to, you know, what, 130 million popular votes across America, 124 million votes, those 10,000 votes are that smaller number in a congressional district, not so important. Right? It's basically you're an economist. It's the law of numbers. Mm -hmm. And so I think a congressional district system, first of all, makes a small number of voters really important to presidents, which leads to transactional policy, which gets expensive for the taxpayer. I think redistricting becomes a very real mess when presidents have an opinion. And I think, you know, either suppression, what they would call suppression on our side, suppressing the voter rolls, or what we would call fraud on their side would have way more of an impact in a congressional district system. And I think that's something worth thinking about. So, gentlemen, we're coming uh, to the end of our show here. And I thank you again both for uh, coming on the set today and uh, helping everybody decide on this issue. And you get 90 seconds to make your closing statement. Uh, either one of you can start. So. Oh, we're not going to talk about the NFL draft. Is no, no, okay, no, draft. Well, <laughs> it was brought here under false premises. <laughs> that's right. Here, here's, here's the lowdown. I mean, follow the money. There's a heavily, heavily funded liberal organ or donors behind this cause at the National Popular Vote. Look it up yourself. The board of directors, look at their FEC reports, how they give money to it. You've got to pause and say, why are, they, why are they pushing for a fundamental change of our system? I believe it's because they look at the, the nation and they look at the population centers. And when they look at that, they say, look at this. Most people live in cities over 50,000 people. The people that live in cities over 500,000 are heavily, heavily in favor of Democrat candidates or liberal progressive candidates. They look at the issues that are involved. Uh, things like guns is, is my favorite one to talk about. There's a big distinct difference between metro areas and rural areas, but things like um, redistribution of wealth is another big issue that rural uh, counties and uh, urban counties don't see eye to eye on. So what's going to what's going to happen in a national popular vote is it shifts the focus of these presidential campaigns to these metro centers. They'll have large get out the vote campaigns in those cities. New York City and LA are no longer just uh, stops for fundraisers. They're now big machines. And what they're going to end up doing is they're going to turn out millions of more people that are going to likely vote for their candidate. Pat? Yeah, so is Fargo, so is Omaha, so is Oklahoma City, so is Arlington, Texas, so is, um, I, I, so, is, so, so is North Dakota, so is Alaska, so is South Dakota, so is Utah, so is Oklahoma, so is all of these other states that are flyover states right now, and their overvotes certainly don't participate in the presidential election. Now, I don't think any candidate, I don't think any candidate benefits or any political party benefits one way or another from the national popular vote. I think who benefits is you and I. I believe that if you think every voter in every state, whether they're a Tea Party voter or a liberal voter or a conservative voter or a moderate voter or an independent voter, if you believe that every voter in every state should be treated the same by the American president and the candidates who seek the presidency, there isn't any question that we should adopt the national popular vote. Now, right now in this current system, four out of five voters in four out of five states are politically ignored. Two-thirds of the political resources are targeting voters in just four states, and that battleground is shrinking. And it's leading to bad public policy out of Washington. Now, if you're a concerned gun voter out there, I would just say to you, you either believe that there are more Americans who support the Second Amendment than there are Americans that don't. And I think most polling would indicate that there are more Americans that support the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Under national popular vote, every one of those voters would matter to the outcome. Okay. Now, I think if you're a pro-choice voter, you should understand that, you know, a majority, I mean, all pro-choice, it doesn't matter. What we need is we need a system where candidates and political parties develop a message of resonance with the majority of the American people, whether they live in cities or rural America, right? And that they run campaigns to every American. 
because every voter in every state should matter equally in every presidential election. And that does not happen with the current system. If you agree with that, I would urge you to call your senator. I would urge you to call your legislature because the Constitution grants them the power to fix the problem. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on the show, Jake. I appreciate it. Good to be back. Pat, thank Happy you for coming here. on thank the show. You. And that's our show for today. We're coming to the end of uh, the time here, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Once again, we broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock until 5 o'clock in SCC Television Studios here in White Bear Lake. And uh, we also have our YouTube channel, which is YouTube black backslash dot com, Tony Hernandez Show. Thank you for tuning in. May God bless you. May God bless America. And bye con Dios.